here's a question for you. Who calls the checks and signs the check at your dairy? And who will be doing that 30 years from today? Do you have a plan in place for how to make the transfers of ownership, decision-making, and assets all happen? Well, here's the truth. So many multi-generational, multi-million dollar family dairy businesses have no official transition plan. In fact, a survey by Egg America found that more than 75% of family farms in the U.S. still have completing their transition plan on the someday list. But if you're ready to start someday today, keep on listening to this Uplevel Dairy Podcast. This is the Uplevel Dairy Podcast for dairy farm owners, managers, and advisors who are committed to profitability, sustainability, and excellence. I'm your host, Peggy Cawthine, and it's my mission to bring you the conversations that will uplevel your skill set and your mindset so you can be a top performer in the dairy farming business. So where do you start with having these sometimes uncomfortable conversations and figuring out all of the tax consequences and everything that goes in to passing on the family farm or even relocating or perhaps exiting the dairy business altogether? Well, our guest today starts with three critical questions for each generation involved. Leland Kutstra is an accountant by training with Fraser LLP, a California-based firm that serves dairy clients nationwide. However, as he helps farm owners with their tax planning, he often also helps them start planning for their future. And there are three critical questions that he asks the senior generation and three other critical questions that he poses to the incoming generation to provide a clear picture and a place to start to build a plan for passing on a multi-generational, multi-million dollar dairy farming business. This episode is brought to you by High Ground Dairy. High Ground Dairy provides global market intelligence, insurance services, futures and options brokerage, and advisory programs to a diverse range of dairy market participants throughout the supply chain. Enjoy this conversation with Leland Kutstra. When it comes to looking at these scenarios and potentially it's a plan to exit the industry or to pass on the business to another generation in the family. And you work with multiple generations often, right? So could we call that Gen 1 and a Gen 2, even a Gen 2 slash 3, where Gen 1 would be that person that is in ownership and perhaps has a son or daughter or other family member that is very much at active in management, maybe has transitioned into some ownership or maybe not yet. And then potentially even throw a Gen 3 in there. That would be the children of that that next generation that are maybe in their early 20s or their late teens and have that dream of dairying or that dream of being some part of a family business. Is that kind of how you see things playing out oftentimes in the conversations that you sit and have in the in in the room with these producers and their family? Absolutely. There's certain days in the dairy or running a dairy where you get up and you, you run the dairy because that's how you're always doing it, right? And and it it's just the pace of life you're running. You're going through, you're running the dairy, you're operating day to day. But I, I really enjoy taking a proactive approach and, and occasionally having those conversations of, okay, we're, we're running this dairy, things are going, where are we headed? We always want to see the business continue, right? It's a huge part of family life. It's a huge part of their financial position. But are we pulling in, in, in a direction that we, we can easily identify? As a firm that's been working with dairies since the 1950s, we've seen not just how the dairy industry has transitioned and changed over those years, but families change. And just like there's a, a thousand ways to run a dairy, there's a thousand and one different ways that families operate. And so we we see it all across the gamut as far as I've had clients in their 80s that still call all the shots. And they've got sons and daughters in their 50s and 60s that have never had to make a decision. I've had the exact opposite where generation one, as you called them, basically handed over the reins early on and generation two has the opportunity to run with it. And so it's, it's wide ranging as far as 
what goes into that transition process. I would say, in my experience and kind of what I've seen, I think the transitions that are the most successful, that seem to be the most sustainable, are the ones that it's not a deathbed conversation, right? It's a, it's a conversation that's been going on for many years. Whether it's an exit plan or just a transition plan, the one thing that that is most impactful that I see is if that conversation's been started a long time before. We don't always know exactly when that transition's going to happen, right? Things things come up and things change and and we try to avoid some of those unforeseen volatilities, but if we can have the conversation early and we can start talking through and laying the foundation for what that might look like, my experience has been that that's, that's the best path to pursue a transition of some sort. Regardless of what that transition ends up actually looking like, having that conversation, being candid during those conversations is a huge part and really sets up a family or a business to make decisions that are right for everybody involved. Because ultimately, the dairy is a business, and the family is a family, and those two things sometimes are not pulling in the same direction. So we, we try to navigate around some of those those hurdles by talking about it early. Yeah, and talking about it, having those conversations, it's easy to say that, but sometimes, I mean, you and I both know, Leland, it can be hard to, it can be hard to have those conversations. It can be uncomfortable. It can be the thing that a lot of people put off talking about. So when when you are sitting at the table and you start to ask those questions and start to really identify the long-term vision, the where are we going, that that aspect of things, I'm guessing that there's probably some common core desires that you find in these different generations as you uncover and help them to articulate the words that maybe they have a hard time finding themselves for what it is they truly want. And so could you break that out? Do you find that, say, that Gen 1, that generation that is the oldest in the operation in the business, what is it that, what's underneath most often their desire? What do you find that they tell you that they want? In many cases, yeah, that's a great question. I would say the the vast majority of that Gen One that we're talking about, if if you really poke on them and prod them, they they want whatever they're transitioning to the next generation or the next group to be a blessing and not a burden. It can be said in many different ways. They want to set their kids or the next generation up for success. They they want it to run smoothly. They don't want it to cause a lot of stress and and really hamper somebody else's growth. That being said, a lot of that generation one is actually generation two or three in their own way, right? Because that came down to them. And so a lot of times when I see that, there's also the underlying desire to carry on the legacy of what came before them. And so even though maybe that previous generation's not around anymore or that they're they're no longer involved, there's still little soft points, little sensitive areas that, you know, we we often want to call those out and identify them early because generation two is looking to generation one and, and often wants to honor generation one and show respect and carry on the legacy while also recognizing that the dairy industry looks a whole lot different in 2024 than it did in 1994, right? And so I think a lot of times I'm seeing Generation 1 really hesitant to, to shackle the next generation with a stressful operation. And I see Generation 2 in many cases, excited to take on a, a more of a leadership role, but recognizing that doing things the way we've always done them is not conducive to, to a long-term successful strategy in in the markets today. So it 
what you're sharing there, Leland, is you see it in some ways, at times, some hesitation from that Gen 1 in what they're passing, in what they are passing on, but also the desire to be able to pass on some sort of blessing and not a burden, as you shared. But then also that next generation that has the opportunity to step into ownership and higher level management that they're recognizing as well that things are changing, times are changing, and not only is the industry changing, but perhaps their own expectations of the life that they want and their own bigger picture, that's that's another piece of it too, right? That that might be different as well? Absolutely. There's There are huge differences between generations. I think we're we're seeing that as a culture between Gen X and Gen Z and millennials and every generation has little things that they've experienced, big things that they've experienced that have huge ramifications on, on what their long-term goals are, or the things that they value and cherish. And, and it's, it always makes me laugh when I talk to some of my older clients and hear about how they got started, right? There's, there's a large contingency of, clients that emigrated from from Europe and they were sponsored by a third cousin and they started in a milk barn and they eventually bought two, three cows and they, they lived in unlivable situations and, you know, they've really built from ground zero. And then you see the next generation who grew up enjoying the fruits of, of a lot of that labor and there's an underlying expectation that they're going to be where their parents, where it took their parents 40 years to get to, and they're going to get there in three. And it's, mm-hmm. and I think some of those desires or expectations really can create a lot of friction, inadvertently so, but I think it can create a lot of friction because the two sides are have very different expectations of what it looks like to be a business owner, what it looks like to to operate. And so part of my job in a lot of these types of conversations is to navigate those expectations, pull those expectations out a little bit so that they're out there so that we can talk about them. The generation one might have no problem passing on something that's going to be a real slow trudge towards feasibility, whereas generation two might say, hey, I I can make this amount of money elsewhere. Like I, I need something more than, than, than that. And so that, that can come across as really ungrateful or spoiled, but it can also come across as I can't operate the way that this is being done right now. Those are some of the really hard conversations throughout these types of transitions is just kind of reconciling expectations versus what's feasible. And, and, especially in situations or families where there's maybe four other siblings. How do we navigate that? What's what's fair and equitable? Because that's not always going to look the same for everybody. So Leland, as you're talking about those hard conversations, you're speaking to a lot of our listeners and a lot of people can relate to what you're sharing, no matter which side of that fence that they are on themselves. And you talk about being able to draw out of people what it is they want and being able to have some curiosity and ask some questions. And so for you, when you're having that conversation with that first generation, that Gen 1, we'll call it in the business, what are, if you could, if you could say there's three questions that you ask that generation one to really start to get to the root of what it is that they want, and what their bigger picture truly is, what would those questions be? I like to start a lot of those conversations or discussions by trying to figure out and and asking what their goals and what they what they consider success. I I have never heard the same answer twice when when I ask that question because everybody has a different picture in their mind of, of where they're headed, what they would like to do. I have one young client that I, I asked him that, and he told me his his goal is he wants to be able to have coffee every morning with his wife. Like he, It doesn't matter what he does the rest of the day. As long as he's home in the morning, he can have a, a, a cup of coffee with his wife. Like he can, he can navigate it. And I think 
success looks a whole lot different at different points in somebody's life. And as as that generation one kind of starts ramping up for handing over or selling or transitioning to the next thing, a lot of times they, they haven't taken the step back to figure out what that what that success or what that end goal is for them. I often don't expect an answer right away. It might be an answer that gets kind of worked out over two or three meetings, three, four meetings, as we kind of start talking about different options and scenarios and what they what they could do. I had a, a client a year ago say they wanted to move to Hawaii. It was great. It was nice, easy goal that we could we could shoot for and we were able to get there right and so that's that's an exciting thing for me but i I think asking about what their goals what their definition of success is really helps me understand their mindset what it takes they might have a very simple definition of, of success that gives me a lot of flexibility to kind of work through some of the other obstacles or they have a very, very specific goal in mind that I really have to allocate a lot of resources and effort to hit that goal. But I think it's an an enlightening question. Other questions, what's your timeline? If I'm talking to generation one and they're 55, you know, some guys are thinking about retiring at, at 60. Some guys are don't want to retire until they're 95. What What's your timeline? How long do you want to be doing what you're doing in the role that you're doing? Do you want to Do you want to transition slowly over time? Do you still enjoy the day to day? You like the cows and buying feed. You don't like dealing with employees. Great. We We can navigate with that, right? But really understanding their timelines and and kind of how quickly or how slowly they're willing to go really give kind of gives the conversation some context it's one of the one of the challenging parts about transition planning is the conversation might have happened or started 20 years ago but it's always been someday we'll do this someday we'd like to do this we we think you'd like to do this at some point and there's no context to it and so you end up 15 years down the road and you're still having the same exact conversation and there's still just as much gray in the whole conversation. So I like to ask about the timelines too. No, no. And it, it's it's a really good way to have the conversation, but it doesn't get much accomplished when you when you don't put specifics to it. One other question that I really like to ask that Gen 1 is, with the equity position that you have today, knowing all that you've put into it for the last 30, 40 years, if you were 30 and you saw what the market is today, would you jump into this yourself? A lot of times I'll hear that Generation 1 talk about how much the industry's changed, how much of it is now about technology and risk management and all these new things that we've had to add to the tool belt of dairy producers as an industry, right? And they they like the old days where they could focus on the cows and, and focus on feeding and, and making it making good money doing that. And so by asking them, if you were thirty, if you were thirty five and you're sitting on a $20 million equity position like you are, would you would you allocate that $20 million into dairy, or would you go do something different? If they tell me they would do something different, we can have the conversation, okay, so do you feel like you want to set up your next generation into that? We don't have to continue the same path just because it's the path we're on. And I think, I think that's a, a good way to kind of start getting the wheels turning a little bit because this is a great time when you're going through a transition to be creative and to, to brainstorm what you really want to go towards. A lot of times when you're when you're in the day-to-day, it's really hard to change course. But when you're having the conversation, 
you have to take the opportunity to say, are we still going in the direction that we need to go as a family, as a business, as a dad and daughter, whatever that is? I think those are questions that that I really like to ask and, and see kind of where that leads the conversation. Those are some hard hitting questions, Leland. And so, okay, so normalize this for a moment. When you when you walk into a room and you talk with your clients and you ask these questions, like on a percentage basis, what percent have an answer for you that's clear and concise right away? Very few. And I I, I think that's a that's usually a, a sign of a good question, I think. I don't want the transition plan to be something that was thrown together in an hour meeting, right? I want it to be something, especially when you're dealing with family dynamics, family-owned farms. I want it to be something that's mold about. I want it to be discussed at the dinner table. I want it to be family members getting together, thinking about what are the goals of, of the kids? What's the goals of the spouses, right? The dairy industry often is, is, a, is an entire lifestyle for families. And so you, you want to make sure that you have buy-in from the entire family, not just the person who's signing on the dotted lines. And so <clears throat> I, I think transition planning and succession planning, I prefer it when we have a long runway to make those decisions because that gives us the best chance to make sure that we're not we're not steering directly towards a big pothole in the middle of the road. So key takeaways here as you ask those questions and you get to the heart and the root of what that Gen 1 truly desires, it's okay for them to A, not have an answer right off the bat, and B, take time. Take the time to really think through and uh, there have got to be times, Leland, when you ask these questions and you get emotional responses, whether it's anger or sadness. I'm sure there's a lot of things that come up. And what does that tell you? I think you get a, a, a wide range of emotions. People don't like to talk about what happens when they're not involved or when they're not around anymore. That's, that's never a fun conversation and there, there's also, you know, a lot of defense mechanisms in those conversations, too, is are we are we asking because we see a, a pot of equity that we're trying to get our hands on? Are we asking because we're trying to speed up your timeline? So sometimes those are motivations, right? I try to avoid situations where it's a money grab. I try to avoid situations where we're we're driving right towards a conflict and everybody knows it. Often I'll I'll start conversations by by talking to Gen 1 first, separately from Gen 2, and then I'll have a conversation with Gen 2 and kind of identify, okay, these are the areas where maybe we're going to have some issues and and really spend time crafting how those conversations need to get started. I can't control the conversation, right? People need to be able to get things off their chest and talk things through. But a lot of times if we if we think enough ahead of, and we're we're trying to be tactful, we're trying to be thoughtful, we can we can craft the questions in a way that's less disarming or more disarming, less confrontational. And then the the sibling dynamics and and a lot of these succession planning that that can be wide ranging too, and so I'm I'm still I'm still working on ways to navigate that sometimes, but that's a challenge. So you just mentioned bringing in the Gen two for conversation as well, and you've laid out questions that you commonly ask Gen one. What is it that you ask Gen two? The first question I ask is the same one I asked Gen one. What is what's your version of success look like? It should look very different than the Gen 1 because their their horizons are very different. How much risk are you willing to take on, right? Gen, Gen 1 is trying to exit and, and have plenty left over so they, they, can, they can live the lifestyle they want. Gen 2 is often at the base of a mountain and they want to climb it. And so 
what are your goals? What success look like to you? And and though that can be a long conversation because they're they often start thinking about providing for their family and carrying on the legacy of the prior generation and they want to grow or they want to move to a different part of the country. They they've got they've got a lot more things that they kind of think they might want to do because they've got a lot more time where they're they think they're going to be operating that that dairy. What are the skills that maybe you haven't developed yet that you need to develop before you really step into the role as the primary owner of this business? Like I alluded to earlier, I've I've had clients that <clears throat> largely handed over their reins to their 25-year-old son or daughter and let them kind of learn by fire. I've had clients that didn't hand over the reins until their kids were in their 60s. I don't necessarily think there's a, a perfect time to hand over the reins and let somebody take over what you've built up, but I do think by having the conversations early, we can start identifying, okay, we need to expose Gen 2 to meetings with bankers, conversations around risk management. How about we give them the chance to do some some feed buying and some repro protocol decisions? What What are those skill sets that maybe you've gotten to where you are because you but you haven't had a chance to really take on those skills or those challenges. I think that's a huge part of the transition period because we want to make sure going back to it being a blessing not a burden. We want to make sure that Gen 2 is well well equipped to start taking on those responsibilities when it's their responsibility. And that's Gen 1 and Gen 2 coming alongside each other through that process. So, I like to ask them kind of what are the parts of their job? What are the skill sets that they they think they could really learn some more in along the way? And then what kind of long-term outlook do you have on the dairy space in your region? What's your long-term outlook here? Do you see challenges on the horizon that maybe we need to start talking about now? So, if, for example, if you're stepping into a dairy and, and you you think long term because of new environmental regulations, you're going to need a, a larger land base, right? Maybe we need to build something to that line or along those lines into our long term goals. How are we going to tackle that problem ahead of time so we're not squeezed at some point in the future? Because I, it's a transition of the business, it's a transition of the family. We want to make sure that every part of it is lockstep with each other so that we're we're not running into pinch points along the way. So really, Leland, when you have the conversation with Gen 1, you start out by asking the exact same question you asked the U.S. Gen 1, and that is getting them to define what their picture of success is, what success looks like to them. And then you back that up for Gen 1. It's then asking them about their timeline and the the deadline for when they wish to do something different or a bigger goal that they have. And to not just have that as a someday goal, but to actually start to put a stamp on where that timeline is. And then as you turn to Gen 2, the second question that you pose to them is really asking them to identify in themselves what they need to do to be able to be who they need to be as managers, owners, and leaders of these businesses. And then as you follow up with question three for Gen 1, you are putting them in the position to say, what would you do if you were 30 years younger? And and really helping to lead them through the thought process of putting themselves in the shoes of the generation that would be next in line in their family. And then the question, number three question you had for Gen 2 for that next gen is helping them to also put into perspective, are you where you need to be as in geographically, knowing what you know right now, the scenarios, the opportunities, and the threats in your specific area, is this where you want to be? 
is this geographically where you are able to set yourself up to be successful. And so two incredibly powerful sets of questions that cross over and complement each other quite well. And by the time you have conversations with both sides of of the family, that generation and that first generation and that next generation, you're starting to paint a much more clear picture, aren't you? I'm trying to put together a picture and I'm trying to put together a game plan of how we really merge those pictures of success and how do we get there? Like what, what's the, what's the playbook to get there? I, and I think that looks very different for a lot of families, but it, it also, especially that question where I asked Gen 1 what they would do if they were 30 years younger, 35 years old, it kind of breaks down some of those generational differences because if you can kind of start putting yourself on the other side of the equation and, okay, what would I do in that person's shoes? It makes it a whole lot easier to hear kind of what their desires are as opposed to you're only looking at it from... 30 years down the road and and it's a different thought process. So really I I try to align the two groups as much as possible and then we figure out what are the what are the parts of the whole transition that are untouchable like we that's not for sale. That's that's not something that we're willing to do for this reason this reason this reason. But it it does open up a lot of opportunities and and if you told me your ideal ideal version of success is this, well then I'm going to remind you, you told me that when we put put a plan together that accomplishes that. And if, if you're not happy with the plan, well then, okay, then let's go back and like re reevaluate what your success is because maybe we missed a mark somewhere. It's a good way to kind of keep in line and make sure we're always pulling in the right direction too. So as you have those conversations, and as you said, as you get further down the line in in deciding, making making real decisions as part of the transition plan and the plan for succession, and there's got to be times where you do, as you just mentioned, you kind of hit those roadblocks where something doesn't line up with that original vision or the original vision that was articulated. So just speak to a moment. It's That's okay, right? I mean, it's okay to take that time to to hit the pause button and to, to revisit. Like, it's okay to slow down the process and hit the pause button, right? Absolutely. We never know 100% what's coming, right? I mean, I think the last four or five years of our lives have all taught us that Things are outside of our control more than we even realized beforehand. I had clients that were marching pretty pretty confidently towards exiting the dairy industry, buying commercial pieces of property, and you know kind of making that transition and Covid hit commercial buildings largely across the country started going vacant cap rates changed, interest rates climbed, all of a sudden that no longer makes sense for the, so, so we, we got to kind of shift. We're always looking ahead. We're always trying to pay attention just because we said something was our model of success. Doesn't mean that it's not in stone, right? It's in sand. We can, we can scrub it and, and rewrite. But, but I, I think as long as we're always keeping in mind what the current direction we're pulling is and we're lockstep with it we can pivot as a group if there's a reason to pivot right and and i think so much of this is it cannot be two people talking amongst themselves but not interacting together i think Mm -hmm. we need to have those conversations throughout we need it needs to be a ongoing dialogue all the way through and then even when you get through a transition, a lot of times that's still your mom and dad. That's still your kids. Our our goal is that there's always an ongoing support throughout. Ideally, the perfect scenario, Gen 1 meets their version of success. Gen 2 has opportunities to to really pursue their version of success. And at the end of the day, they or twice, you know, they get together at Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and it's it's a great situation. That's often what we 
pull for. That's kind of how we at Frazier, that's kind of how we gauge our success. Are we making our clients' lives better, helping them get to where they wanted to go? So you've just articulated the depth of the process of succession planning, transition planning, and really before the planning starts, it's having some conversations that may be hard at times, but truly are the foundation of getting to the root of what's driving the desire and what's the desired outcome and asking some really good questions about what it's going to take to get there in the direction that each party wants to go. Well, Leland, it's been such a pleasure to have you on as a guest on the Up Level Dairy podcast, and you provided some incredible insights into both succession planning side, these questions to start with, and for the next generation stepping into business ownership and management. Well, I have one last question for you. And so it's funny you talk about the first question that you ask Gen 1 and Gen 2 is, what is success look like to you? And oftentimes when I'm interviewing producers on this podcast, I have a few questions that I ask them. And the first of those questions is actually that same question. What does success look like to you? So because it's your favorite question to ask, I want to throw it back to you and hear your response. How do you answer that question? I think success for me in my career has been helping my clients reach their goals. I love to be a trusted advisor. I love to come alongside my clients. We can do taxes. We can do financial statements. That's all good. It's really important. But at the end of the day, if if I can look back at my career and say I was instrumental or I was helpful in helping these clients reach the goals that they were really looking for and, and pursuing, then I did my job. I can rest with that. That would be good. Personally, I, I want to be a good husband, good father, good friend, and share the love of Christ. That's, that's my goal. If I can check those boxes, I'm good. I'm, I'm very happy with that. So that, that would be my, my success. Well, thank you for sharing that. And it sounds like you are well on your way to achieving your version of success in the work that you do through Fraser LLP, Leland, and the things that you're doing every day to help our dairy community to become stronger and sustainable and achieve their own version of success. Thank you very much. You just heard from Leland Kutstra, accountant with Fraser LLP. Join us back for our next episode as he shares what he sees the top 10% of dairy producers doing to set themselves up to successfully step into a multi-generational, multi-million dollar family dairy farming business. This episode is brought to you by High Ground Dairy. High Ground Dairy provides global dairy market intelligence, insurance services, futures and options brokerage, and advisory programs to a diverse range of dairy market participants throughout the supply chain. Find all the links for High Ground Dairy in our show notes. And once again, I'm Peggy Coffey, and thank you for listening to the Up Level Dairy Podcast.